Welcome to the Art and Science of Joy podcast. This podcast is all about inspiring people to live more joyfully. So if you're seeking a bit more joy in your own life or seeking to bring some more joy to the lives of others, then this podcast could well be for you. And welcome to the Year of Joy series in which I talk to experts on special superpowers that each and every one of us can cultivate in order to build more joy into our lives. I'm Andrew Cannon, and I have the honor to be your host. And in this episode, I'm excited to be talking with Dr. Tony Warner about the joy superpower of belonging and family. Dr. Tony is a dedicated mum of four, a seasoned psychotherapist, certified and high-level mentor to leaders and parenting entrepreneurs, engaging inspirational speaker and best-selling author. A leader in the self-development and mental health fields, Tony believes that the intersection of the relational, spiritual, and social-political aspects of ourselves is vital to explore to begin to bring more health, joy, and satisfaction to the world, and, and who doesn't want more of that? But having previously struggled with burnout, mental health, and toxic relationship patterns herself, Tony, through these challenging experiences, led her to pursue what real-life balance actually is and how to incorporate it successfully. Dr. Tony values highly impactful yet practical strategies that infuse science, psychology, and soul to inspire her audience and powerfully support her clients. Well, welcome to the podcast, Tony. Thank you so much for having me. It is a joy to be here. Excellent. Well, <laughs> Um, the bio is fantastic. Lots of words I could dig into there. Lots of interactions, lots of interplay between different modalities. But first of all, maybe tell me and our listeners about your own experience with belonging, relationships, family. And that'll get us going. You know, that is a loaded question, I have to say, Andrew. That's, that's the pleasure of asking the questions. Right. Um so I, I, just as a little bit of background, I am mixed. So my dad is black. My mom is white. Um, they were both pastors and they also divorced one another twice. So they got married, divorced, got married, then divorced. And then they married other people. Um, and, and, so, and I grew up, you know, the daughter of pastors who were divorced, the daughter of a, a female pastor when female pastoralship was looked down upon the daughter of a, of a black man. Um, who was often a black pastor in white churches. I was overweight, um, tomboy-like, and I moved a lot because they moved to different churches. So I became the new girl quite frequently. So without even going into all of the stuff that's beneath that, it's fair to say, like, I just didn't really feel like I belonged. Mm -hmm. I didn't feel like I belonged um at home I didn't feel like I belonged in the schools I didn't feel like I belonged in my friend groups and it's not because I didn't have relationships I did in fact I was a social butterfly I was really good at that right okay. I was really good at being a social butterfly um and I was affectionate I was the affectionate one in my family and my family was not very my immediate family was not very affectionate and so I just felt like I didn't I didn't fit in I felt mm -hmm. like I didn't belong so what that meant for me was I want to feel like I belong. So I'm going to do whatever I can that helps me feel connected in some way or like accepted or wanted in some way. That for me looked like overworking, overachieving, overcompensating, overconsidering, overthinking. <laughs> A lot of over words there. A lot of over, over words, right? And the like, and the like. Um, so I have a complicated relationship with the word belonging. Um mm in the family context and otherwise. So there's a lot there. Um, but I will say that if I were to say the long and the short of it is that it was complicated and painful, but desire, like desirable. It, it was something I really, really wanted growing up. Yeah. And do you find that that sort of impacted where you've actually gone with your own life, um, that experience you had growing up? A million percent. I I believe now, I didn't know then, and I don't even know that I really tried to put words to it then if I thought of it, but I believe now that I was, I was born into the family and situations that I was born into 
because I really am meant to explore the intersectionality of all of that and how that affects our sense of belonging, how that affects our sense of purpose and meaning and our ability to experience joy and, and connection in our lives. And I'm in a really unique place because of my experience to be able to support people with that, that I would not be able to do in such a powerful way had I not experienced the decades that I experienced in the way that I experienced them. Yeah, that's amazing. So did you know that in an early age or did that something that sort of hit you like a bit of a thunderbolt later in life? Both. What I did know at an early age was two things, and these have stayed constant my entire life. I wanted to be a mom and I wanted to be a mom of five kids. I have four kids right now. I, my number has never changed. I still would love to be a mom to five kids. Um, so I wanted to be a mom because I wanted to create um, a family unit where we all felt like we belonged. Like I felt like as a kid, like if I feel this way now, like maybe I can create a family when I'm older where everyone feels that connection and belonging. Um, so my my desire for that has become more healthy over the years, but that has always been there. And the second one was that I wanted to be a professional helper. So I wanted to help people. I wanted to be in a career where I could help people that felt some some way similar to how I was feeling. They were silently struggling behind the mask. Those two things have always been my, con they've never changed. And they are still true to this day. And that is what I do. That is what I do. And I, I truly believe it's just embedded in the very fiber of who I am like that. They just are so meaningful for me to show up and embrace both of those. And that's wonderful. That's wonderful. I, I sort of pick up on two elements here. There's there's an element of obviously family, parenting and, and kids. And then there's obviously a sort of family in a sort of more relationship, um, adult to adult, sort of whether that's in marriage or, or outside of marriage. So we're going to touch on both of those. And maybe we we'll start talking about the relationship part of this. And um, and, you know, it's it's something I think everybody who's been in a relationship knows that you have, you know, you, you tend to start off really good. Otherwise, you wouldn't start off. Um, but then after a certain amount of time, um, things can spiral downwards. And, and then obviously, as we know from various divorce statistics or even looking at people in marriage who maybe don't divorce but are not happy in that relationship, that things can can spiral down. So before we talk about sort of the, the bottom side of things, are there any sort of tips that you've learned um, over the years through your work to help people from preventing their relationships from spiraling down if they start on that descent? Yeah, I mean, I do think it depends on where you're at in your journey within your relationship, right? So for example, what might be a really impactful tip for me now personally in my marriage is going to be different perhaps than it was nine years ago, mm -hmm. right? When we first, when we first got married. So I, I want people to just kind of keep that context in mind, but I will give, I will give a general tip that I think is really powerful regardless of where you're at on your journey, but how you apply it and how you navigate it is, is going to be affected mm -hmm. by where you're at. So what I would say is that you don't want to let anyone else have dominion over your joy. Mm. No one else gets dominion over your joy. And if we expand that, no one else gets dominion over your emotions. That doesn't mean that how they behave isn't going to affect how you feel. That's not what it means because we're human. We're a social species. We're a sensual sexual species. We're an intersect, right? Like we're going to have feelings about other people's behaviors, about what they say and do to us, right? but they don't get dominion over that. And so a good way to navigate around this is to ask yourself, how am I feeling when they do this? And then even though I'm feeling this way and they're doing this thing, can I, or do I want to still choose joy anyway? Mm -hmm. Not for them, right? Not because of them, not for them, not through them, but just for yourself. This is a question you can ask yourself for yourself. 
if you're in a place in your relationship where your communication is more open and it does feel safe to, to have this open line of communication, then you can say it out loud. You know, so-and-so, I feel blank when this happens. And I know I can still choose joy. I can choose to experience joy right now and cultivate that right now if I want. And and leave it there and see how that feels before you take action, right? Yes. Now, right. now the action that you take might be you need to take a walk. It might be that you further a conversation. Mm -hmm. It might be that you do choose to step away and engage in something that helps you cultivate joy in that moment. But what this is going to do is it's going to help you identify how you're feeling, something that's contributing to how you're feeling, but not giving it dominion over mm -hmm. everything. Because you're taking your ownership back and saying, okay, yes, I feel this way. And yes, this is part of the reason why. But now I get a choice. Like I've acknowledged it and I get a choice. And it gives, a, there's a lot of power in that one sentence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you repeat that for, for me and for the listeners? I'm so listening to what you're saying. So if you repeat that power, how do you get that power? What do you say to yourself? I feel blank when blank. So whenever the thing is happening. Yeah. And I can still experience joy if I choose to by dot, 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 dot. Mm. And that can be something unrelated to, to what's happening. That could you say be going out into nature to just take a, take a break and. Yes, it, it will very likely, if you're choosing to step away from that situation for the time being, it will very likely have nothing to do, right, with that situation. <laughs> um, right. And that's not a bad thing because I'm not encouraging you to distract yourself to the point where you're not willing to deal with what needs to be dealt with. Mm -hmm. But what I am saying is that know where you're at emotionally before you choose to deal with it, right? Yeah. yeah. This sentence helps you do that. Yeah, and I think that's really powerful because I find, you know, even in my own situations where, you know, I've had some of those challenges that I tend to find that my personal reaction just tends to be to apologize um, and sort of then keep it inside. Mm -hmm. right? And so, so the next time that happens um, it doubles down, right? It doubles down, triples down, and then you end up sort of in this loop where it's hard to break out of that um, because you haven't brought it up before. So I think what you're saying is bring it up and let the other person know that it hurt you or it made you feel some type of emotion that you didn't want to feel. And to get that out in the open uh, is probably... Yeah, I mean, well, emotions do compound themselves, right? Which is kind of what you're hitting on. And people don't think about that often because it's not tangible. It's not something they can mm -hmm. see or touch, but it is something you can feel, right? And so if it's not addressed, it is going to snowball. That is absolutely true. No way around it. That's going to happen if these strong emotions get suppressed. However, as far as saying how you feel out loud, I, I want to bring people back to where you're at in your journey. Because again- mm -hmm. Where I was at, say, seven years ago, even in my marriage, it, I wasn't in a place to be able to say out loud how I feel and actually no. have felt hurt. But now I can. Mm. Right. So what's most important is that you can say this to yourself, first and foremost, and then you assess where you're at in your journey as to whether or not it's going to be helpful to say it out loud for your partner yeah. no, your, or your really... child. Right. To you. Right. And then that brings you back to then that connection of knowing what brings you joy, what, what you can do in that situation to actually come and come back in a better space. Um, and though you have that power, that dominion thing, I think it is really powerful to think about that and to think that so there's not too many things we have in our lives that we have control over. Um, but that really is how we feel, how we react, how we proact um it's very powerful and, and we can always make that choice i think yeah i think um yeah i don't want to go i don't want to take us on a tangent but what I, I will say is just i think that us humans and i myself did this for many decades what i think we get too caught up in control and mm. and it really messes messes with us right and so i would just switch the word choice whenever possible to choose right like i have choice maybe i don't have control 
but mm. but choice maybe i have choice and what are my choices here what choices do i have and that brings with it a sense of of freedom or at the very least a little bit of relief depending on what the situation is it could be more mm. it could be less relief but it gives some breathing room right that i have choice absolutely actually i think when we were looking at the we had world happiness day um mm. a while back and one of the things there was I'm happy to say as someone who's lived in Finland, that Finland, number one again, six year in a row, yay, go Finland. Um, but one of the things when they looked at the, the different things which cause a feeling of, of happiness, as, as they define it, which is life satisfaction. So it's not really happiness, it's, it's how satisfied you are with your life. Um, having this ability, freedom to choose um, yeah. is one of the six variables within that. So it very much aligns with what you're saying and how that, challenges but as you say on the other hand we are social animals we we want to belong we want to fit in uh, we want to appease we want to feel part of that tribe whether that's a bigger community or even a family so that can sort of challenge us in that relationship for sure for sure let's let's switch and talk a little about kids right because um many people have kids uh, not everybody but those who do um everybody was a kid i presume at some point <laughs> Um, um, so, you know, everybody knows what that's like, but, but in particular parents, and, you know, we know the last few years have been stressful, um, for parents in, in many ways, and, and many parents have struggled as of many children, um, with that relationship. And I presume that's something you see in your work. Oh, yes. I mean, not even just parents, I mean, schools, right? Mm. Because children were at home. Um, and, and parents were at home together more often, probably than most of them have ever been together before for yeah. <laughs> consistent periods of time. Um, and, you know, not everyone was modeled healthy relationships. Not everybody was taught how to manage their emotions in the midst of a, a toddler tantrum or, you know, a, a teenager that is really trying to establish their sense of independence. And so how do we take a break when there's not a place to go for sure, mm -hmm. right? And, and we almost have to, we have to create a place to go, whatever that might look like mentally, physically, whatever the case is, right. because we we do all, all need a break. And otherwise we just don't, if we don't have a place to let it out in some way, shape or form that's healthy, it's going to grow. It's going to compound itself just like we were talking about. And it becomes very frustrating for the parents, for right. the children, for the teens, whomever is in the family together in that same household. Yeah, no, definitely. And have you seen since, you know, the schools are now back, obviously, and, and things are not, not back to normal. Uh, things are new in the new new normal um do you see a change or are there still a lot of residual effects and oh, there's still a lot of residual effects for sure yeah and so you know many parents may be listening are sort of thinking yeah i can relate uh to what dr tony's saying i can i can see that in our own family dynamics um do you have any advice any any things that you could share in general again with with parents to get them sort of thinking about how they could start rebuilding that relationship ultimately with their children because it's such a powerful relationship that it's going to stay with that child through the rest of their lives i presume and impact how are they going to be parents um if and when their time comes so it has a long-term impact um so it'd be great if obviously people could mm -hmm. help start mending those relationships this is a really important question and and I, I am going to to answer you, but I, I just want to give a little bit of a caveat in that because I believe in how important that question is, mm. I want to say that, you know, no answer that I can give in a few minutes is really going to do justice to what I know so many families and parents and children have experienced. Uh -huh. um, and so know that this is this this is what I'm able to provide within these moments that we have together. And I understand that there's there's more above and beyond that. Mm -hmm. And certainly I'm not saying that everyone had a really challenging um, or traumatic experience within the parent-child relationship these past few years. Some had challenges that created, that did create deeper connections. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so everyone has had a, a bit of a different experience there, but everyone did have some kind of experience, right? Everyone was impacted in some way. And so 
what I what I want to start with first is that it's not that we need a social species. It's not that we need necessarily to to belong. It's that we we confuse belonging with connection and we need to feel connected in a meaningful way. And there's very there's nuanced differences between the two, but if we if we just focus on that meaningful connection Maybe, for example, your teen doesn't feel like they belong in the family because they're going through a different experience right now. Or maybe you feel like you don't belong there as the parent because you're like, what is going on? Like, my kids are all over the place. Am I doing something wrong? But it's really the what's missing, what you're craving internally is this meaningful connection. So if we can mm. just find small moments here and then there and then here and then there to just meaningfully connect. And it could be in the most minor of ways. Maybe you know that one of your kids really, really loves physical affection and you've been so busy, you haven't been providing that to them. So maybe you just notice that there's some sadness or frustration on their face. So you put your hand on their shoulder or you offer a hug to meaningfully connect, Mm -hmm. right? There's so much power in the repair that we don't have to focus on trying to go backwards and redo or quote unquote fix anything yeah. because we can't, <laughs> right? We we do need to be willing to f- forgive or yeah. ask for forgiveness. And that's a, that's a huge topic, right? In and of itself, but that's mm-hmm. going to be a part of the healing as well. Yeah. So if we focus on meaningful connection in the moment, not forevermore, that's way too big and overwhelming, but just yeah. right here, right now, as I, I look at my child or my partner or myself, how can I show up in these few moments meaningfully connecting? If we focus on that, and then when we do mess up or if they do mess up, we're willing to practice or ask for forgiveness. Those two things yeah. will go such a long way. They're so powerful. Yeah. Um, and I think, you know, thank you for sharing that, Dr. Tony. It was really simple but very profound and I think that's what I like to add and as you said you know you can't do justice in in a few minutes to such a huge topic but the connectedness and we had an event a while ago on celebration of joy and one of our panelists um Sherry Elise talked about how connectedness is a is a huge joy superpower she started as I think you brought up as well connectedness to self because if you don't have that true connectedness to who you are and that understanding of who you are and and your own value um it's really hard to then reach out and connect authentically with somebody else even even a family member i think that was an interesting way to to put it and i love the way you talked about the micro moments and not looking at as hey you, you know you have to fit in as always into the family right if otherwise you don't belong and and to instead just cultivate those little micro moments of connectedness and what was the other thing oh forgiveness and how you can use that as a tool i suppose to to get through the bumps because none of us are perfect and so if we can learn to forgive ourselves as, as well as forgive the others, then I presume the connectedness can only grow out of that forgiveness. Yeah, yeah, that's that's so so key, and I agree um, that you know our. I, in fact, I believe I talk about it in my book too. Um, that part of really being able to experience joy in its in its depths in its purest form requires a sense of Mm self-worth. And I don't mean, again, I don't mean like forevermore, oh, I'm this worthy human being and I just always believe that all the time. I just mean in those moments, right here, right now, I'm allowing myself to experience this joy and I believe that I'm worthy of experiencing it. Yeah, and, and I suppose that's when the challenge comes when people then attach that to how the other person so again, maybe we go back a bit to relationships, but also can apply to children. But if, if your self-worth is fixed to how the other person perceives you or how the other person treats you, 
then that's putting yourself at risk, I suppose, of, of losing that, that sense of self-worth. Well, joy is such a powerful, powerful experience that if, if in just if for a few moments, you can suspend your self-criticism or guilt or shame or blame mm. and allow yourself to experience it, then it's going to pour over to those around you. So it's not just a gift to and for yourself. It mm. is an overflow gift that is then shared with those around you. It is so contagious. It is so spreadable. Mm that, you know, sometimes as parents, it's like, oh, well, my kids are having a hard time, whether they're having a hard time on their own, and you're feeling bad about that, or they're having a hard time, and they're taking it out on you, and you're feeling angry about that. It's like, yeah. well, how am I supposed to feel joy with that, right? right. But if, if we can take a step back, allow ourselves to feel how we feel, like, remember, we don't want to discount our emotions, but we, we don't want to give their behaviors dominion over them. If so we find a way that works for you to take a step back, Step away if you need to. And when you're ready, allow yourself to choose something that helps you cultivate just a few moments of joy. Those mm. few moments of joy will ripple out in some way, shape, or form within your relationships. It, it will. And the more you practice that, you're not going to be joyful forever, forever. That's not possible. No one can stay in joy 100% of the time. But the more you practice it, the easier it is, the, le the more ease there is in allowing yourself to kind of ebb and flow into the experience of joy. And therefore, the more you can share it with others as well. So others benefit when you take moments to cultivate joy, even if those are really challenging relationships for you at the moment. Yeah, that's wonderful. My challenging relationship is with my camera at the moment. Just <laughs> decided not to play game, which is always fun when you're doing this type of thing, right? So mm -hmm. it's, it's maybe there's a message in there for us to talk about joy. Um, and let's talk, you know, bring it back to a personal level and my thumb, um, maybe your own four children bringing you joy. And, and what else brings you joy, Tony, in your in your life? I know you're going to ask me this question and I think it's tricky um, because one of the ways I differentiate joy from happiness is that happiness is conditional, which means that, you know, I feel happy because I have kids. I feel happy because my kids are behaving this way. I feel happy because someone got me this thing. I feel happy because of this condition. Um, whereas joy is like, despite conditions not being ideal or as I want or whatever the case is, I can still experience joy. I can still cultivate it in these moments. And so the way I would answer that question is what helps me to cultivate joy rather than what, what something outside of me that brings it to me. Um, and so what helps me to cultivate joy is walking, is having deep talks, um, in a safe environment, what helps me to cultivate joy is music and dancing. Um, what helps me to cultivate joy is sunlight and baking and cooking. What helps me to cultivate joy are things like those, those kinds of experiences where I really allow myself to fully show up for them and enjoy them. I like that distinction, actually. It sort of brings it from the outside to the inside. Yeah, and again, it's a power thing. I think I'm learning today um, about the power that we have to have the power. So we don't have to be passively sitting there waiting for joy to fall in our laps, so to speak. Um, we can proactively think of what ways we can go out and cultivate joy. And those can be just the little micro things as well as anything more major. I think that's part of a problem as well, that quite often they get attached to these big things. Um, you know, I'll be joyful when I'm on a holiday or I'll be joyful when I retire. And instead of looking down at the right now uh, and what's in this moment you know, can help me, enable me, empower me to cultivate that joy. So I like that. Um, my joy 
it's not going to depend upon this technology and whether it's actually working and this is being recorded or not. Um, <laughs> that we will find out later on. Um, but tell me about your book, please. You mentioned the book, so please tell me about that. Yeah, because, you know, I think it's so cool because I have a chapter, the last chapter of the book, chapter eight, is um, about my core concept seven for resetting yourself. And that's, it's called cultivating joy. It's the perfect, it's it's just like the perfect insert here, right? Um, and I, I said, joy is beyond mere happiness. It's a deeply felt sense of inward pleasure, freedom, and invigoration all wrapped up into one. That's how that, that chapter starts. It's really cool. The book is called The Reset, A High Achiever's Guide to Freedom and Fulfillment, your step-by-step roadmap for getting unstuck. And this is for any aspect of your life or relationships where you really want to get unstuck. It mm. provides prompts so that it's custom to you. You get to personalize it to help you reset whatever area of your life you want to reset. And it is available on Amazon. Great. Fantastic. And you frame that for a high achiever. What's, tell me a little bit about that. What's the the inspiration behind that? The people that most often are attracted to working with me um, are folks that tend to, like I said, I got stuck in. Um, they tend to overgive, overdo, overthink, overcompensate, overwork, overextend, right? And so mm -hmm. they can easily find themselves in that overing type of thing, that overachievement type of patterning in their lives. Um, and so they can wind up getting stuck in that. And even though they're doing all the things and maybe have marked all of the, the boxes of success that they're quote unquote supposed to mark, and yet they're not feeling that sense of fulfillment. And so that happened to me multiple times um, in the past. And I was able to, through intention, effort, work, energy, and resources to find a personalized way to reset, just like you just reset, right? And so- <laughs> this is so you're going to love the synchronicity of the universe, saying, you know, it just brought me back at the perfect moment. <laughs> I, do, I do love it. Um, um, and so this is, whether or not you label yourself as a high achiever is irrelevant. I don't like labels. I would not have labeled myself as a high achiever during that time. Um, but it, that's who, it, this is who it speaks to, to the person um, that tends to over, overextend themselves in some way um, yeah. and wants to experience more fulfillment in their life. Yeah, no, that's great. I, I love the concept of that. Maybe yeah, it's an, actually over this overgiving um, of trying to, to please, and especially in today's world where there's so many demands upon our time, um, ones that are put from the outside as well as ones we put upon ourselves um, to make our lives super busy, and it can really suck you into a place where you are underachieving on on everything you're doing, and that sort of multitasking becomes suboptimal tasking as i like to call it mm. where you're actually doing less even though you think you're you're doing more and it can eat away at your joy um, that i know from personal experience and from doing that so that connectedness is what i'm going to take away from today along with the forgiveness aspect i think those two two things combined um can really help people um, in their relationships with their partners and also with their their children, also holding dominion over your own joy, not giving that up. Um, another super, super tip for today. So thank you very much, Dr. Tony, for coming on to the podcast and talking with me today. Thank you for having me. You are more than welcome. You are more than welcome. It's been a real pleasure. And I hope you, our listeners, enjoyed this podcast episode as much as I have. And I hope you feel inspired to cultivate the joy superpower of family and connection. So, and if so, you can check out the show notes for the links to Dr. Tony and, and her book and other resources. If you're already a member of the Year of Joy community, please join us in the community forum where over the next few weeks, we'll work together on integrating some of Dr. Tony's tips into our lives, which is going to be a lot of fun. And if you're not already a member of the Year of Joy community, please visit our website, theartandscienceofjoy.com to find out more. And please join us on this year-long journey of joy. Thanks once again for listening. I hope you tune in for the next episode of the Art and Science of Joy podcast. Until then, stay well, stay joyful, and stay connected. <laughs>